My name is Jennifer White I'm with the Portage Park District and welcome to Fly Like an Eagle. We are going to learn a little bit about uh, the eagles that we see pretty frequently at some of our Portage Park District properties and I'm excited to share that with you. The eagle, the bald eagle is one of my favorite birds even though this is such a success story and we see them more and more frequently now in Ohio, I it never gets old. Every time I see a bald eagle, it just makes me pause for a moment and be grateful for the opportunity to see that beautiful, graceful bird. The, my very first experience with seeing a bald eagle in the wild, not in a zoo, was when I was in college. I was taking my ornithology class. It would have been around circa 1997 or so. And I was at Kildare Plains out in Wyandotte County, out in Northwest Ohio of all places. And there was a adult bald eagle that was hunting in the field. And at the time I was really stunned by that because my understanding of bald, of bald eagles was that they hunted in the water exclusively. So that was a really good learning experience. And we'll talk a little bit about some of the different things that bald eagles eat but they are normally found near water. So that still is that that still is true, but nature is full of exceptions. And so they, they wow us all the time. So I'm excited to share this beautiful bird with you. And what we're gonna do tonight is uh, talk a little bit about the history of the bald eagle, both in the United States and how we almost lost this uh, symbol of our nation and also its history in the state of Ohio. We're going to talk about the current status, which is good news, spoiler alert, it's great news, um, current status in, in Ohio, go over some identification tips, and especially for those uh, younger adult, young adults and immature eagles, you know, what to look for, how to tell an eagle from some other large soaring bird that you might see. And then I'm going to spend quite a bit of time on behavior and some life history about these birds. Finally, I'm going to share what are the best places in our Portage Parks to see bald eagles, as well as share a few other um, tips of places around the county that you can, or in nearby counties where you can uh, go and observe them safely and, and easily. So here we go. Remember, if you have any questions, please put them in that Q&A box, and I will get to those at the end of the program tonight. So first, let's start with a little bit of history way back when the United States was um, first being settled, it's estimated, and of course we weren't counting in the same ways that we do now, but it estimated um, over 500,000 bald eagles that lived in uh, North America, um, in the continental US anyway. And in 1782, the eagle was officially named as our national symbol and it was given a, a place of prominence on the seal of our country. And Soon after that, like early to mid late 1800s, we started to see significant population declines in bald eagles. And the primary reason for that was hunting and habitat loss. So habitat loss as we were um, clearing and changing the land as the settlements were moving west, um, took out much of the habitat for these birds, but also bald eagles have a tendency to be um, a little thief, a little thiefy. <laughs> so they'll steal food from other animals. Um, they'll steal fish from anglers. And uh, they're a pretty large and impressive bird. And so they were seen as a threat um, to food sources. And so they were they were hunted almost as a as a pest. In 1940, Congress passed the Bald Eagle Protection Act. And I should note that while this act is still in existence, it has been amended and is now called the Bald Eagle and Golden Eagle Protection Act. We do have two eagle species in the United States. Uh, we only have one that nests in, the bald eagle is the one that's predominantly in Ohio. Occasionally we do have golden eagles though that, that come into the state. So if you are an Ohioan, you still have a chance of uh, seeing a golden eagle and they're slightly larger than the bald eagle, uh, look slightly different and are mostly found out west. 
1945, DDT became available for public sale. And I'm going to come back to the impact that DDT had on the bald eagle population, but I wanted to put that in the timeline just for reference. So that happened in 1945. In 1962, Rachel Carson uh, published her book Silent Spring, uh, which drew attention. It wasn't the only reason that DDT was, you know, got onto the the radar, but it definitely drew attention to the impact of that chemical as well as other chemicals um, that we were putting into our environment. And what kind of impact was that having on our water quality, on the the animals that were using that water, and then of course on us as humans. In 1963, the U.S. hit the low point. So in the continental U.S., there were only 417 bald eagle nests. So that's the lowest um, nationwide in history, 417 nesting pairs. In 1972, DDT was banned for use in agricultural and household. And in 1973, the Endangered Species Act was passed. Um, the bald eagle was listed as an endangered species. And I want to spend just a moment here on the Endangered Species Act just to, uh, if you're not familiar with listed endangered species. I wanted to explain a little bit about how that works. So the Endangered Species Act um, gives protections to animals that are deemed or plants that are deemed endangered. Now um, when we say that we say there they there's a whole process that has that has to go through to document the fact that these populations are in decline seriously enough that they're deemed to be endangered or threatened. So endangered when something is considered listed as endangered, um, that's we're, we're in pretty serious peril. And then threatened is still on the endangered species list, but it's a lower level listing. So it's good news. Um, when something moves from endangered to threatened, that means that it looks like there's a chance this population is starting to, to come back, but not enough to take away the protections um, that are afforded under that, that act. In 1995, the bald eagle was moved nationally from the federal and um, endangered list to threatened list. So it's still protected under the Endangered Species Act, but now it was listed as threatened in 1995. And in 2007, um, and I remember when this happened, it was just a, you know kind of amazing um, to think that uh, that, that they were back, but in 2007, the bald eagle was delisted, which means it was taken off of the endangered species list. There's a whole other documentation process that goes into that. And when an animal is delisted, there is a plan, a monitoring plan that's put in place. In the case of the, the bald eagle, there's a 20 year monitoring plan to make sure that those populations um, continue to be stable. And so, Theoretically, in 2027, we're still going to be in good shape, and the bald eagle um, is going to be considered a stable population. I just put this up from the, uh, this is from eBird and from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, um, just showing the timeline nationally where we went from that 417 nests to a documented over 71,000 nests nationwide. So significant increase. Before we move into Ohio and what's going on in Ohio and kind of the history and where we're at in Ohio, I wanted to touch on DDT and why that was a problem. Because if you go back and you look at that timeline, um, when DDT was introduced, um, it was soon after, there, as we, we can look back and see, there was this direct correlation between the population numbers of the bald eagle, as well as other raptors like the peregrine falcon and osprey. So all of those animals eat other animals, including, um, including fish. And so what happens and what the problem with DDT was and other chemicals like it is that it gets into the water system. So in 1945, DDT was available for public sale for agricultural and for household use. In 1963, again, just to remind you of that, uh, the, this timeline. In 1963, there were 417 nests in the U.S. That was the historic low point. In 1972, DDT was banned. And then in 2007, the bald eagle was finally delisted, 
taken off the endangered species list nationally. So what happens with DDT is it gets into the water and in the water, it's really not, there's, it's a very, very low concentration. Um, and that's really how we me measure, measure toxicity in a lot of our, um, uh, you know, approved use chemicals. And so in the water, it's not, it's not, it's a very, very small amount. However, the zooplankton, which are tiny little macro and micro um, invertebrates, they feed um, and they accumulate, they live and feed in the water, they accumulate more of that, it starts to bioaccumulate. And then as you go up the food chain, what eats the zooplankton, but the tiny little fish, and so we find concentrations slightly higher. Now we're up to 0.5 parts per million. Then what eats the small fish? The larger fish. So now we have larger fish eating these smaller fish. Those concentrations, um, they, it accumulates and increases. And what eats the larger fish? Well, now we have our, our fish eating birds like osprey, bald eagles, and others. And so the concentration of DDT in this top level predator is much higher than the amount that's actually in the water because it has bioaccumulated in the tissues of the these different animals in the food chain and that has magnified the concentration of DDT. Now most of the time this was not toxic to the adult birds but what happened was it hit the eggs and the way that it presented was that it kept the eggs from being able to have hard shells. So Subsequently, the eggs can't um, produce and, and grow into a baby bird. They get broken, they get smashed, they aren't viable. And so the uh, adult birds were unable to successfully reproduce for quite a while. You know, in fact, if you look here, it's um, you're looking at 44 years from the time that um, that the we hit that historical low until the bald eagle was federally delisted. You know, another um, 35 years between the time that DDT was banned until the bald eagle was federally de delisted. So, and this is a slow process, and I'm so grateful for the fact that uh, 1972 happened um, because we were really on the brink with only four, a little over 400 nests nationwide. That's not many at all. So in Ohio, just to give you an idea of what was going on here, in 1979 was when we hit our low point. Our historical low was only four breeding pairs of bald eagles in the state of Ohio in the late 70s. Can you even imagine? Four breeding pairs in the entire state. So in 2007, as we know, it was delisted from the endangered species list at the federal level, but in Ohio, um, it, it was still listed as endangered um, on the state, the state list. But in 2009, the populations were such that, you know, they were big enough that the Ohio Division of Wildlife went from monitoring each individual nest really closely and um, they would you know, document where the nest was. They would go in and band those eaglets and so they could track uh, their their lives. Um, they would take a lot of uh, different you know, weights and measurements of the eaglets to um, study you know, the health. And in 2009, they stopped doing that and they were able to switch instead to aerial surveys to survey the population and give estimates of the population of bald eagles in the state. In 2012, the bald eagle was officially delisted in the state of Ohio. So it was taken off the endangered species list in the state of Ohio. Um, if again, you're not familiar with endangered species lists in state versus federal, you know, in some areas, maybe federally across the nation, a uh, species is doing, you know, what biologists deem to be um, a healthy, you know, they're doing well, the population is healthy, it's not in decline, but maybe in a specific state, uh, the population is in decline. So some species may not be, maybe uh, not endangered on the federal level, but may be listed as endangered within the state. So in 2012, Ohio celebrated and the bald eagle was removed from the state endangered species list. Currently, um, we have extra exciting news. So remember, in 2012 was when the bald eagle was delisted. 
So this was the last time that the Ohio Division of Wildlife did a statewide nest census where they went and documented every confirmed the existence of every nest that they could in the state of Ohio. And then the subsequent years, all of the nest surveys were estimates. So just estimating the population and they estimated that the population went up. In 2020, it was the first statewide nest census since the species had been delisted and 707 nests were confirmed in the state of Ohio. Isn't that amazing? So really great success story. This map shows the results of where those different bald eagle nests were confirmed, that 707 total. And you can see in Portage County, we had eight that were documented here. There's still a few counties down in Southern Ohio and Southeast Ohio, uh, mostly just because of habitat uh, where we're not, we're not seeing any eagle nests yet. And most of Western Ohio is uh, lower numbers. Mercer County stands out. If you're not familiar with Mercer County, that's the location of Grand Lake St. Mary's, which is the largest man-made lake in the state of Ohio. And so that probably accounts for the higher number out you know, as an outlier there. But you'll see most of the large numbers are up near our, major, our larger rivers and along the shores of Lake Erie. So Ottawa by far um, beats the rest of the pack in terms of eagle nests that are are in the county. Fun little series of uh, fun little timeline here to share with you. Back in 1996, there were only 13 counties that had even one bald eagle nest located in the county. By 2000, there were 25 counties that could say that they had eagle nests. By 2005, 34 counties. In 2009, 57 counties. And in 2020, there were 85 of our 88 counties had at least one bald eagle nest located in the county. It's pretty impressive going from four bald eagle nesting pairs to over 700, right? Really good stuff. All right, moving on to some identification. So we know they're out there. <laughs> We've got over 700 nests in the entire state. We know they're there. So how do I, we identify them? It may seem um, pretty easy, but there are, especially when they're not an adult, sometimes they can be tricky. So I'm hoping to walk you through some of that so it's easier for you to identify a bald eagle from something else. So first, their feathers. The adults, if you see here on the right, the adult feathers are all dark brown, that bright white head, a bright white tail, which you can't see in this picture, but we'll see in a few other ones. Bright white tail. Um, but the immature eagles are a little bit different. So this is a, a young eagle that's a fledgling. So they are they're also dark brown. Um, and honestly, the only two times that that eagle is going to be consistent in its coloring is when they're an adult and when they're a fledgling in their first year. They're almost all dark brown. They do though still have those yellow feet and they do have yellow on their beak. So that's another identifying characteristic is the yellow beak and the yellow feet. I also just wanna draw your attention to the beak shape and size in proportion to its head. I mean, these are some massive beaks that these birds have and so when you compare this, I have another slide where we'll see uh, some different, some other raptors. There's no comparison in the size and shape of this beak. So it's, it's, it's just giant. Weight, these are big birds. So they average 10 to 12 pounds, but they can definitely weigh more than that, especially an adult female. Um, the height, they average about 32 inches, a wingspan of up to seven feet. I mean, that is a big bird, right? This picture in the middle shows just one of the many variations of a immature eagle in the air. And so when you first glance at that, I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't have a fully white head. It doesn't have, um, you know, fully dark brown feathers. You still can see those uh, yellow feet though. Uh, and the another characteristic of a eagle in the air is that they fly with their wings straight out, straight as a board. So when they're soaring, um, you're not going to see, uh, as we'll see shortly, you're not going to mistake them for anything else. A couple other identification keys. I love this 
graphic from the avianreport.com to show how they their colors can progress as the eagle ages. They don't reach this adult plumage until they're over five years old, um, some even a little bit later than that. And so again, the two consistent coloring color combos that you're going to see with the eagles are when they're fledglings and when they're adults. All of these stages in between can be highly variable, but in general, it's a mottled brown. So any combination of brown and white. A couple other things to point out. Notice even though we have some yellow on the beak as a, as a young eagle, the yellow is going to intensify as that eagle ages. The white on the head is going to intensify as the eagle ages. The picture in the upper right hand corner shows an adult bald eagle with a fledgling. The very first time I had the privilege um, of participating in some eagle bandings when the Division of Wildlife was still doing uh, banding. And one of the most remarkable things to me about that process is realizing how large these young eagles are right before they fledge. Most of the time, the young eagles will actually outweigh their parents because the parents have put so much energy into feeding and caring for their young that the young, by the time they're ready to leave the nest, they are larger or at least as large as the parents. Here's another immature flying in the air. Remember that board-like wing straight out? You can see um, this one, this is pretty characteristic of an immature eagle too. Sometimes they'll have some of that uh, white coloring underneath at, at the bottom of their tail, but not always. You can't, you really can't count on that. You can see those yellow, those yellow feet though. When you're up in, if they're up in the air and you don't have binoculars on you, um, really look for that size and shape of their, their soaring. It's different than anything else. Same look on the adult. We've got the yellow feet, the white tail, the white head, the yellow beak, and then this dark body, both front and back. So can we get confused with other birds? Well, you won't be confused after tonight, <laughs> but I can understand how people do get some of these other birds confused. So first, let's start in the upper right hand corner with the red tailed hawk. Now, red tailed hawks are tricky in and of themselves sometimes because younger um, red tails don't always have a bright red tail and their coloring can be very different, like on their especially on their breast. One way to tell a red tail um, at almost any stage is they have these uh, dark shoulder patches. They don't always um, extend down that far, but you have those dark shoulder patches. Red tailed hawks also fly with their wings straight out, but they are half the size of the wingspan of an eagle. So size in and of itself is going to eliminate that an eagle as an option. Also, if you've got binoculars when you're looking at these, take a look at that beak. The size of that beak in relationship to, in proportion to the head versus the size of this beak in proportion to the head of the eagle. Completely different beaks. Staying along that flying soaring line, down here in the bottom right hand corner we have the turkey vulture. Really common bird that we see soaring in our skies in Portage County. And the way that you can tell that this is a turkey vulture and not an eagle, if you can't see its face, is the, the form of their wings. So uh, turkey vultures fly what we call a tetrahedral form. And so their wings are up in almost a V. And you'll always see, you can spot those. If it was an eagle, they would be straight across, straight as a board. So that's the way to tell the two. This guy in the center shares the same habitat often as eagles, so they do get into some little, a little bit of a ruckus occasionally, and they eat the same thing, and they even share some of the coloring. So if you saw this osprey sitting on a tree or on a pole, and you saw it from the back where you saw this dark coloring and this white head, and you get all excited and say, wow, it's a, it's, it must be a bald eagle, it's got that white head. Well, you look a little bit closer, and other than size, because the osprey is significantly smaller than the bald eagle, there's a few other cues to look for. First, no yellow beak. Um, osprey do not have yellow beaks. Second, look at this white on the, the belly. Osprey have completely white bellies, completely white chests. 
And so if you're seeing one soar up above, it's really easy to tell that it's not a bald eagle because ospreys have that bright white belly, which even an immature eagle is, isn't going to have. And they have these dark patches um, on the outer parts of their underwing versus, again, our adult bald eagle, white head, white tail, yellow feet, and beak. And no white on the belly. So hopefully that'll help you as you um, are looking up at the sky and wondering if that big bird up there is an eagle or not. Um, once you see an eagle in person, you won't forget it and you won't confuse it with something else. So let's move into some habitat and behaviors of these animals. First, adults usually remain in Ohio. So while the immature birds may migrate, uh, they move around a lot, trying to establish territory. The adults usually remain in Ohio, especially um, if they have paired up and they have a nest, they usually will want to uh, defend that nest even when it's not being used um, to, to raise their young, defend that territory. They eat mostly fish. Now, I was reading about um, a study that was done. They looked at 20 different um, 20 different food habitat studies across the North American range of bald eagles and 56% on average of the diet of bald eagles was made up of fish. If you were in places like Alaska or Oregon or Washington state, that percentage was a whole lot higher. Um, if you were in areas in the middle of the country, then those, uh, those percentages of fish being part of the diet were a little bit lower. But on average, over 50% of the bald eagles diet was made up of fish. That's that's uh, tracks for Ohio too. So most of their diet is made up of fish. However, um, in that same study, 28% of their diet was made up of birds, mostly waterfowl. Uh, there was also a smaller percentage of small mammals and then carrion, especially in Ohio, that's a, a food source for, um, for bald eagles. So you will see them on, you know, on a, a feasting on a, a deer, you'll see them chasing turkey vultures off of, off of carrion. Um, you will see them on land. And in fact, the turns out the bald eagle that I observed, my very first one out in Northwest Ohio, was going after uh, some carrion. Life expectancy. I love this one. They live, this is a long lived bird. Um, so it really can, uh, hang out in the same territory for a long time. They average 15 to 20 years. However, many bald eagles have been uh, shown to live a whole lot longer than that. Um, the oldest bald eagle on record was in New York State, and it was at least 38 years old. And it was banded in 1977. And then in 1995, that eagle was hit by a car in New York. And so it was at least 38 years old. So that is an old bird. <laughs> in terms of mating, bald eagles are monogamous and they will often uh, breed with the same partner for many years. And however, when that partner dies, they will definitely you know find a, a different a different mate in ohio uh bald eagles breed february and march primarily late february into march i wanted to put this picture up here because i read stories often about um males fighting to the death you know spinning through the air lick, uh, locking their talons um, this is a behavior called cartwheeling and it does happen but it's usually only two eagles this was a exceptional one there was a little bit of a battle happening and it's usually between mated pairs who are kind of sizing each other up you know it's like testing out for strength and endurance um, and they will cartwheel they'll spin lock talons and spin um, sometimes coming perilously close to the ground before they break apart from each other. However, once a, a pair is made, not all pairs do this as part of the, um, the mating process and uh, others that have been together for a while, it's, it's like an unnecessary thing. They already know each other's strength. I, I'm anthropomorphizing a bit there, but not all eagles do this cartwheeling, cartwheeling um, behavior. Nesting. 
bald eagle nests are some of the most impressive nests around in the bird world because they reuse the same nest annually if they can. If it's in a good spot and it's sturdy and sometimes they'll reuse it when it's less than sturdy. Uh, was it last, I believe last year, um, the mentor marsh nest fell. Um, you know, and sometimes I see these nests that are just, you know, not, they don't look very sturdy, but they will try and try again. The picture on your screen is of a Vermilion, Ohio nest that's in the record books. It's not the largest bald eagle nest ever, but it was really unique because of its tall shape, its little vase-like shape. It was 12 feet high, eight feet wide, and weighed two tons. I mean, that is a serious nest because what happens is these birds will come and they will build on last year's nests, do a little housekeeping, add some sticks, add some nesting material. And then the following year, we go through the same routine. We add, add some things to the nest. And so this one was over 50 years old. It fell down in 1925 due to a, a storm, which is usually the reason that these larger nests finally go down. Either the tree gives way or it's taken down in, in a storm. And so one of the questions that I'll get, and, and I can't see my Q&A box here, but somebody may have already asked this. Uh, one of the questions that we'll often get is, uh, well, do they, you know, will they rebuild the nest in the same spot? Will they move it to a different location? Um, there are definitely instances of uh, birds that have, uh, where the nest has, has been destroyed or has fallen during nesting season, and that can be pretty catastrophic for that particular bald eagle pair. Uh, sometimes the, the young are are too young and they're, you know, they're not, they're, they're killed in the process. Sometimes um, there's not a place, the tree left to put the nest back on, back into. Um, Division of Wildlife uh, will, has in many cases has built a platform and, you know, replaced, uh, replaced the young and, you know, replaced some of the nesting material. And sometimes that works. The parents will just pick up where they left off in that spot. Sometimes that's not possible. Sometimes it's the, it, it calls for the end of the nesting season. They generally lay two eggs, however, on average. However, they can sometimes lay just one, some three. Um, that seems to be dependent on, uh, like other animals, dependent on food supply um, and the health of, the, of the, the pair. The eggs incubate for an average of 35 days. It can be a few days um, on either end of that, but on average, 35 days, they incubate. And then the young fledge, and so if you're not familiar with fledging, fledging is when they leave the nest. <laughs> so when the babies are old enough to fly on their own and uh, live on their own, that's called fledging. So they fledge or leave the nest. And so after about 10 to 13 weeks, that's when the baby eaglets will, will fledge. I should go back to clutch size, if you're not familiar with that term, the clutch is the number of eggs that are laid um, at a particular time. So eagles usually just do one clutch per year or per, per nesting season. However, there's exceptions to every rule and there certainly are uh, multiple clutch, like double clutch uh, seasons that are documented for some eagle pairs. I would say that would have to be an exceptionally great food year. All right, you're not gonna be able to see all the words on this screen and that's okay, but I think it's really cool. It's a, a, a neat chart because it shows how nesting cycles of bald eagles can vary depending on where they are in the United States. So depending on what region they're in. So we are located right here in the center in what uh, this chart's considering Northern US, includes parts of Pennsylvania, um, as well as a host of other states and here, we start nest building, our eagles start nest building in late November, early December. They start breeding and laying eggs and incubating between February and in through April. The uh, eggs hatch anywhere between you know, mid-March and late June, and then the young fledge um, in early to mid-summer. So you look at other parts of the, the country and that that nesting cycle shifts a bit depending on where they're located. Kind of cool. All right. Okay, I'm right on time. I want you to meet the Hanover Eagles. So these eagles um, in the White House, <laughs> my family, um, we have been watching these for years, for multiple seasons. My husband came across it a number of years ago and we watched them every year. Their names are Liberty and Freedom and they are on a eagle live stream. 
Now this one is in Pennsylvania. And do you say, why, John, are we showing eagles in Pennsylvania? Well, because it's a really great webcam view. <laughs> there are lots of webcams that on eagle nests in Ohio and in other states. So if you do a search for Ohio Eagle Cam, you'll see ones in Cleveland and uh, Avon Lake and Ashtabula and Columbus. They're, they're all over the place. But they don't have this perfect view, <laughs> close-up view of the nest. So I wanted to use these as our example to kind of walk you through what the nesting season looks like, um, how what the changes we see in the, in the eaglets are, um, and how these adults interact. I want to point out here really quick that um, it is very, very, very challenging to tell the difference between a male and a female eagle because uh, they look identical with the exception of their size. And so you could really only tell the difference when um, they're like really right up, you know, they're sitting together on a branch. <laughs> you can tell the difference because the females are larger than the males. Um, Liberty and Freedom have been nesting together for nine seasons nine seasons they've nine different nests they've um they have had together last year's was not successful and i'll talk a little bit about um about that too but nine seasons of nesting liberty is 21 years old so she's uh she's getting up there but i want to give credit here to the pennsylvania game commission um and they partner with hd on tap which has a whole bunch of webcams on a whole bunch you'll see when you google it so if you just google hanover eagle webcam it'll come right up for you um, there's lots of, uh, really fun, like intimate, uh, mating behavior that, that a pair of eagles will do, even if they've been together for, you know, nine nesting seasons, like sharing food, um, you know, giving each other food. Both of the eagles will, both male and female will help build the nest. So it's a, it's a teamwork process to add to last year's nest and get that all spruced up. Copulation and egg laying. Birds, all birds, not just eagles, all birds have something called a cloaca. And the cloaca is like a one-stop exit hole. <laughs> so um, eggs, sperm, um, urine, feces, it all comes out of the same hole. And so how does uh, fertilization happen? Well, in birds, it's something called a cloacal kiss, which is a very, very brief moment where the, the birds kiss or touch their cloaca together and transfer the sperm to from the male to the female. Birds have, and bird female birds have the ability to store sperm. And so it varies from species to species um, how long they store that, um, but they store it until they're ready to lay their egg. And so in this case, um, they laid, they end up laying two eggs not at the same time. I fast forwarded on the time lapse here. Not at the same time. They'll lay the egg, the egg gets fertilized. I'm sorry, the egg gets fertilized, they lay the egg. Um, and then the larger the bird in general, the more time between eggs that are laid. So for example, many people monitor bluebird boxes, myself included. And bluebirds are, Eastern bluebirds are very you know, small little birds. And they generally lay one egg a day. So every day you'll get an egg. Eagles, they have multiple days between their egg laying. So these two uh, eggs were not laid on the same day. They were a number of days apart. Uh, incubating. Another teamwork uh, showcase here with the bald eagles. Both male and female eagles have a brood patch. A brood patch is an area that develops on the breast of extra fat. It kind of plumps up. Um, uh, in the breast of the bird, it's called a brood patch. And in many birds, only the female has a brood patch um, because in many bird species, they're the only ones that incubate the eggs. But bald eagles, they share that incubating responsibility. I put this extreme looking situation up here <laughs> from February during a snowstorm where we've got uh, one of the eagles on the nest incubating the eggs and completely covered in snow. Eagles are designed to be able to handle this kind of extreme condition because they do have plenty of bulk. You know, just their body mass alone is helpful. Also, their feathering. Um, and, of course, they're producing that extra heat with the, with the brood patch. And this situation doesn't last too long. Uh, another cool habit or uh, behavior that bald eagles exhibit is egg rolling. 
So we've got these large, pretty large eggs. And if they don't roll the egg, then the embryo is going to sit for 35 days against the same side of the shell, which decreases the viability of that egg. So the parents will periodically roll the egg. And so if you watch one of these webcams where they still have eggs in the nest, so if you look at a, especially the Ohio ones, um, they'll still, their eggs uh, are, I believe, just now starting to hatch. And so you can go ahead and um, you may still be able to see an egg uh, so that they'll roll those eggs so that that embryo isn't staying on the same side all the time. It's kind of a neat thing to watch. I think there's even some highlight reels on most of these. So you can, I want to look, show you this, uh, take a little closer look at this nest. So we've got all these large twigs and, and branches that are on the outside of the nest. Then they have all kinds of grasses and um, soft material to make the center of the nest where the, the egg is incubated. And 35 to 38 days later, boom. We've got a baby chick. <laughs> we have an eaglet that has hatched. Um, they hatch all on their own. They start pipping, which is where they're starting to punch through that uh, that shell, that hard shell, and they work it out. And when they're first uh, first emerge from the egg, they're just fluffy little. They dry off into fluffy little um, cotton balls here. In this particular uh, case of this nest, this second egg this year did not hatch. Um, I checked the nest uh, two days ago and the egg was still in it and it was 55 days that it had been in it. So well past that 38 or so um, day mark. Uh, so this egg, for whatever reason, is not viable. It could be that it wasn't um, you know, fertilized. It could be that it wasn't, uh, um, that there was a, a problem with the you know, with the embryo um, inside, it could be a problem with the shell because there has to be a gas, um, appropriate gas transfer between the outer, out, outside and inside of the egg. And so that's possible too. There's any number of reasons that that could have happened, but it is not a viable egg, although it's still in the nest. And as of two days ago, anyway, they were still incubating it as though it was, um, as, as though it was viable. Last year, this pair did not have a successful hatch. They had an egg that, uh, just one egg, and, and it didn't hatch. And eventually, I think after about 45 days, they um, removed it from the nest. So here's a really nice view um, from just a few weeks ago of the, the eagle nest. It is fascinating how many predators and in, nest intruders um, you'll see these eagles defend against. So sometimes it's other eagles. There's a lot more competition now, now that the population numbers have gone up. And sometimes it's things like raccoons or um, other birds, snakes. Um, you'll see squirrels, which aren't really a threat to the, uh, to the eagles, but they can, they can steal some, some food. So it's really interesting to watch the, all the critters that come through these nests. Um, this was from just a couple days ago, and so we've got that young eaglet that's in the nest. And also, I have this blown up so that you can see the partially eaten fish that are here. Sometimes you'll see turtle shells. You'll see fur that, you know, nondescript fur from either a rabbit or, or something um, that's in there. And the eagles will not always eat everything at once. So they'll eat a little bit and then save some for later. And so while you see, you know, the parents will come back and you'll see them laying there with the, in the nest with the young and they will be, you know, just uh, tooling around in the nest trying to find some bits of dinner that was still left. So these eaglets are going to continue to grow. And this is two years ago, um, these, these little eaglets, when they start to grow and get these feathers, their true feathers are starting to grow and poke out, you know that uh, we're really progressing here. And eventually they're going to be in, remember that 10 to 13 weeks later, they're going to be fully feathered. They're gonna be as large or larger than their parents and they're gonna be preparing to leave the nest. I wanna to end tonight um, in time, so we've got some uh, time for questions. I want to end tonight talking a little bit about where in Portage County you can see these majestic birds because we are so fortunate to have them um, frequent our Portage parks. So I'm going to highlight three of our park properties that uh, you can head out to. If you go to portageparkdistrict.org, 
You can always find um, the maps and directions and information about the individual parks. So the very first one and the one you're most likely to see a bald eagle at is our brand new park, Trail Lake. Trail Lake was opened last November and we have a pair of eagles that frequent that park. They do not have a nest on the property that we're aware of, but we believe that there's their nesting um, to the property adjacent, which is Herrick Fen State Nature Preserve. So Trail Lake Park is a great, in fact, these photos were taken from Trail Lake um, of the eagles. They generally visit, your best times to view them are gonna be early in the morning um, or later in, in just before just before dusk. However, I've been there middle of the day and have seen them come through. A good place to look for them is if you're if you're not seeing them hunt, a good place to look for them is in the um, evergreen trees that are um, along the edge of the pond, the edge of the lake. Berlin Lake Trail, which is located down in Deerfield Township in the southeast corner of Portage County is uh, a great place to, to observe eagles and lots of osprey. We do see osprey at Trail Lake Park as well. Um, but Berlin Lake Trail, you know, there's a lot of waterfowl, there's a lot of food that's there, there's a lot of good habitat. And if you walk out to the bridge, the shorter route to the bridge, if, if distance is a challenge, the shorter route is from Kirkbride Road, that's off of uh, Route 14. And you can head out to the bridge um, and keep your eyes eyes peeled because you can have you have views on both sides of the bridge across Berlin Reservoir and can often see bald eagles there. Another great place that you can commonly see them is at Towner's Woods Park. If you want to be on the Lakeside Trail or on the Eagle Loop and both of those trails are going to uh, put you in position to see uh, eagle activity over Lake Pippin because Towner's Woods adjoins the city of Akron's Lake Pippin property. So those are three top picks. You can, I have seen them at Seneca Ponds Park. I have seen them at uh, along Headwaters Trail, along the Portage Hike and Bike Trail. Um, I have not seen them at Morgan Dix or, uh, or Shaw, but that's not to say they're not there. Other places in the county that you want to keep an eye out for bald eagles um, would be along the Cuyahoga River, really anywhere along the Cuyahoga. Uh, that's, a, that's a prime eagle. Uh, habitat there and uh, West Branch State, State excuse me West Branch State Park <laughs> um, is another good place to, to spot them. Tinkers Creek State Nature Preserve um, which is part of it is in Portage County and part of it is in Summit County um, and that that property is managed by Summit Metro Parks um, just on the border between Aurora um, and Summit County uh, there is a really nice viewing spot for an eagle nest. So there's a, a little trail um, from the former State Nature Preserve. You can go up, there's a platform and you can look across the marsh and see the eagles on the nest there with the pair of binoculars. If you don't have binoculars, it's gonna, you're just gonna see a big giant blob of, uh, of nest in the tree with the, the occasional white, white heads peeking, peeking up. Also nearby would be down in Stark County, um, Walborn Reservoir, which is just just uh, just south of Portage County, uh, there's a, a nice eagle viewing area there as well. So lots of opportunities to, to see them. Uh, Ladue Reservoir in Geauga County is another great place to look for them. Um, but they are around for sure. Oh, and Lake Hodgson in, in Ravenna is a great one. Lake Hodgson is the water supply for the city of Ravenna. And I will often see them um, on or on, on the side of the, the lake. So good places to, to stop and see these beauties. All right, we've got time here for questions. So uh, my contact information is on the screen. You can email me anytime if there's a question that pops up that uh, you think of after we're done here, please shoot me an email. PortagePartDistrict.org is our website. You can not only find out you know, where our parks are located and get the maps, but you can also look at what else we have coming up for the next couple months and uh, join us for some other programming. So I'm going to stop my screen share right now. Oh yay, we have some questions, I love it, woohoo. All 
All right, so first question. I'm guessing that threatened is not as bad as endangered. Yes, just to review, um, endangered is the, uh, that's when things are really serious. Threatened means it's getting a little bit better. So we're downgrading to threatened. Um, so threatened is not as bad as endangered. Both are still considered listed. Um, let's see, another question. When one of the eggs isn't viable, what do the birds do with it? Um, so again, the, the birds will, at least two days ago, that particular nesting pair still had that 55 or 56 day old egg in their nest. Um, but they will dispose of it eventually. Um, they often will eat it. Uh, the one last year was eaten, uh, but they will dispose of it. All right, another question. My daughter lives in Twin Lakes and they see deer, fox, et cetera, all the time. They occasionally see bald eagles. About 45 years ago, I lived there with my parents and siblings and we never saw any of these, especially bald eagles. My mom and I were thinking it had to do with habitat loss during the intervening years, but is it probably because the eagles have made such a comeback? Oh, great question. So um, all of those animals are, this, this is a really good question because, uh, Habitat, habitat, habitat. <laughs> habitat loss is um, affects all different animal species and can really, you know, really hit that food chain hard. When we see higher level predators like bald eagles um, coming back into like like bears coming back into the state, um, those are great signs because it means that there's enough food um, to support those animals. Uh, so the animals that are lower on the food chain need to have the appropriate habitat to be able to successfully reproduce and to thrive, thereby providing food for the higher level predators. So having bald eagles isn't just a great thing to see, it's also a, a, a good indicator of a healthier environment, a healthier ecosystem that they're able to live and thrive. Um, and I don't want to shortchange the eagles because their ability to adapt has also contributed to their success in their increase in population. They've been able to, because they're a bit of a scavenger, um, they've been able to adapt to uh, much of this habitat being, you know, us humans infringing on and so they they've been able to adapt and to thrive in that um, so it's the comeback of eagles is just a symptom of um, a, a, a good things happening I hope that answers your question I know <laughs> do you do we also have golden eagles or other eagles around here so we don't typically have gold. Golden eagles are the only other eagle in North America. So your options are bald eagle or golden eagle. Golden eagles are primarily located in the western part of the United States, but we have seen them, um, you know, come through this area. Uh, the the wilds that's down in uh, shoot which county um, near Cambridge. That's not the right county though. I can't think. Ah. Uh, there are they they often see golden eagles there so you know it's you're unlikely to see them here um and if you do see one it's because they were just coming through i mean it's um uh, it's not it's not likely but we do in north america have them and you'll see records of golden eagles in ohio all right oh Tinker, Tinker's Creek State Nature Preserve. Okay, the where was the spot on the Aurora border again? Um, and I'm going to blank at the row, but if you search for Tinker's Creek State Nature Preserve, um, you'll see uh, there's an Eagle Trail. Um, there's a little parking lot. It's a short little walk to the observation um, to the observation platform, and then you'll look across um, to the west you'll look across and see the, the eagle nest there. Oh, thank you, Roxy, and Guernsey County, the wilds. Thank you. <laughs> All right. 
If anyone has any other questions, I am happy to answer them tonight. I hope that you enjoyed um, the program this evening. I hope you learned something about the, the bald eagles. And I hope you're out there celebrating with me this awesome comeback that these majestic birds have, have, uh, have done. So enjoy the sunshine. Get out there. We've got plenty of time to get outside and enjoy this unusually warm weather. And uh, we really, I really appreciate your support of the Portage Park District. And I'm happy that you were able to join us here today. Have a great day, everyone.